So we had uh, one lecture on B cell, another on MSC. We will take uh, T lymphocyte, and you will find that there are quite a few similarities, and you need to put them together because uh, when these cells talk to each other, they share those receptors. And uh, we need to know what are the corresponding receptors on each of them. Okay, now I've been trying to emphasize the importance of uh, the new drugs and the drugs that are coming up. That's why we want to make sure that uh, we our update on immunology because quite a few drugs which are in the market actually hundreds of them and I'm just going to give you an example for that not that not that you need to know it at this level but you still have to keep your mind so so I was just reading this uh, drug discovery I mean just like a second ago you don't need to pay much attention to the details but what you can see is that uh, this is a top journal, Nature and Science and Cell, and we talk about drug discovery. So all drug discoveries are happening at the cellular level. So you can see all those ligands and receptors and so on and so forth. When the, talk, the cell talk to each other, that's where you can see all those blockers with CD number are there, uh, and that's where <laughs> most of the drug delivery is going to go okay so don't think that hey you know i just need to vomit it right know it and vomit it no that's not the case it's more of a self-directed learning uh, that you need to set up your own uh, pace but uh, even if you close your eyes doesn't mean the fact is not there that is a fact that if you want to stay competitive, you want to stay in the market, that's the future. So keep that in mind and as we go along uh, for this particular course, I will just hold you responsible for whatever I tell you while we are lecturing. Okay, and that's what the deal was. So anyway, I'm going to talk about the T-cell receptor today. What is a TCR complex? And what are co-receptor molecules? And that's where most of the emphasis is. And that's the change. What are the important molecules expressed on T cell? I think your challenge will be um, that you may get confused. Hey, which one is on B cell, T cell, you know, things of that nature. So you have to work your way to find out what are the specific receptors. We'll also talk about T cell production. And then I'll, I'll talk about the term that we use negative or positive selection today. <clears throat> so let's begin with the T cell receptor. <clears throat> Uh, again, it is a receptor that talks with an antigen. And again, uh, <coughs> as we discussed in BCR, it also has the same combination of genes. So we have V, B, J. So variable chain is very important, joining, diversity, all these are important. And you can see that when, when I told you about uh, B cell combination, I said 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 13. But T cell has 10 to the 18, enormous amount of gene rearrangement that is there. The other important thing is that you want to link all these lectures together. It also comes from immunoglobin superfamily because the way the peptides are arranged, the way the, the cylindrical kind of uh, peptides are there, invaginate into plasma membrane, they have extracellular, intra cellular and then they have a uh, intermembranous part. We'll also talk about their valency. We'll also talk about their antigen recognition, but there's another term that uh, I'm going to introduce today. And I, I'm pretty sure we did talk about that in endocrinology, receptor location. So you have like, you can have upgrade of receptor. So you can have the receptor going towards you know a majority into more receptor express 
right? Over expression or under expression. Likewise, we also talk of something we call receptor being secreted. So you can imagine as an antibody, which is a receptor, and antibodies are secreted. So that's another thing to keep in mind that these things are not permanent. We normally use upregulation of receptors or downregulation of receptors. Right? So that's another a, a break or an accelerator in this case. And we'll also talk about uh, the T cell itself. What happens to the T cell? So TCR, TCR itself uh, remains patent. It doesn't go through conformational change per se. But it does initiate the signaling pathway that, again, in this case, is outside. Now, when we talked about BCR, so I just told you there's a BCR, there's a co-receptor, and these are the two chains that you remember when we talked about the development of B cell. Now, in this case, T cell receptor is not alone to initiate the signaling pathway. Again, the same rule applies. You don't have one key to open that important door. So you have more than one. So you want to make sure that everything is taken care of. So we have a complex there, which is called TCR complex. So TCR complex is different than TCR alone. TCR is a part of TCR complex. When I say TCR complex, I'm talking about a TCR, which has alpha beta chain, then there are two other important molecules. One is CD3 and other is a zeta chain. So CD3, zeta chain and TCR, three of them join together to form a TCR complex. But also remember that CD3 over here and the zeta chain, they do not bind an antigen like when we have BCR and the two co-pilots or co-receptors, I give example, they are a part of signal transduction. They do not bind the antigen. Antigen binding is only on a very specific place on BCR or TCR, which is a kind of a variable determining uh, region, VDR. So that's, I told you, a very specific amino acid amino acid sequences there. Now, in this case, there are some other molecules which are phosphorylated. Remember when we talked about BCR, some of the signaling pathways are similar because they are the similar enzymes. We talked about kinases, we talked about phosphatases, we talked about, uh, in the BCR, I gave you example of at least three. One was psych, fin, lin, so these are those specific proteins which are present uh, in the inter intercellular or uh, cytoplasma, cytoplasmic kind of structures, proteins which are there. Now in this case, uh, <clears throat> what is happening is, if you remember I said two important enzyme cascades that are important, one is protein tyrosine kinases. Right, and the other is MAP kinases. So these are the two important pathways in signaling molecules that you will just, I think, be given in detail in biochemistry. But as far as I'm concerned, without going into structural element, I would want you to know that there are protein tyrosine kinases. And as the word kinases suggests to you, it's more towards positive thing is more towards activity, a signal transduction. If I was to say phosphatases, so that will chew up phosphorus and will be stopping the activity. So that's like a basic thing. There was a term that we used earlier in pathophysiology, ICAM, which was intercellular adhesion molecule. These were those molecules that stitch two cells together. Okay, and we talked about gap junctions, we talked about zona occludens. So these are two or three important junctions that join the cell. That's where the action potential is transmitted from one cell. Why does a cardiac cell have a all or none kind of 
action potential and not the other cells. Why do cardiac cells? Hmm? Can go to repolarization. If there was no repolarization, there would be no relaxation. They go contraction, relaxation. Both things happen. But why is it that it follows the rule all or none contraction? That's a, a rule for cardiac muscle. All or none. Sorry? All, all of these three have a threshold. Yeah. I mean, you guess I'm I'm talking about gap junctions. Gap junction. I, I'm already talking about gap junction because of the gap junctions. They are just intercalated discs. They have gap junctions. That's the reason. So they are gap junctions. So gap junctions are important. So in case when a cell talks to another cell, we call a term is called ITAM. It's not an ICAM. It's an ITAM, and you can see ITAM, which are immunoreceptor tyrosine-based activation motifs. So these are the activation motifs which are there i'm going to show you in the next picture <clears throat> you can see them over well we'll see it in the next one it's it's going to be attached to this one so this is a typical tcr so you can see a typical tcr is just like immunoglobulin that's why you have a carbohydrate moiety is two chains and you can see tcr alpha chain and beta chain two chains over here and it has a uh, two major CHO type moieties joined together by disulfide bonds and then these are carbohydrate motifs on, on the site and these are important because many times that's where attachment of other molecules take place and again you can see from here uh, they have an alpha portion and a beta portion and that's where the antigen binds again this is VDR uh, CDR where there is a complement over here that actually snugly fits with the antigen. It's pretty much the same as BCR and again it passes through the cell surface and it passes through the uh, into the into the cytoplasma. So three portion pretty much similar looks like an antibody but this is a TCR. So all these molecules over here would not bind uh, an antigen but antigen will only bind on the, the variable portion. It also has a constant portion over here and these are the variable portions like an antibody <clears throat> because if I say 10 to the 18 different kind of molecules can bind so of course you have to offer that kind of liberty at the uh, end where antigen can bind. So a typical TCR, T cell receptor. <clears throat> if you were to look at the <coughs> biochemistry of that or the little detail so you can see these three complementary determining regions we call CDR. That's what I was talking about, CDR over here, one, two, three, or three, two, one, whatever sequence they are here, they are on the top. So these are the one, just like the gloves in BCR, you keep on changing. So this is the one that determines the capability of a TCR to bind to millions of different molecules. And the other structures pretty much is the same. Right? So you have an alpha, beta, and then you have this distal portion, which you saw in the previous cartoon as two straight lines jutting out of the TCR. But if you do the chemical analysis for that, and you can see, especially if you want to look at the, the peptide complexes, this is how it looks like. So the antigens will bind over here. So these are the complementary uh, binding site we call CDR, CDR, complementary, determining region one, two, three, exactly what we had in BCR. Now, for understanding, <clears throat> again, a host cell, and this is a TCR, they need to talk to each other. Now, the host cell needs to present a antigen, which is just a small peptide to a T cell, okay? And we remember we talked about that the T cell is not gonna look at any antigen, it's gonna look at the protein antigen, it would only look at it if it's presented on a plate of MHC. So does it presents over here. 
Now the TCR over here, you can see from here, uh, has exactly this region over here, which is called hypervariable region. So this region over here is called hypervariable region where things can change. So it's going to look at that specific, like let's say for example, MMR, I give you an example for measles, mumps, rubella. So these small chunks of a portion of antigens of those viruses are presenting to a T cell and T cell will look it up differently. Say, hey, this is, this is measles, this is mumps, this is rubella. Or it looks at, for example, this is a virus that caused problem last year because you want to make sure that the, everything is registered differently. Okay, so this is the portion over here that will change according to that presentation of peptides. Okay, so peptides can present in a different way. There are millions of different antigens, but again, they will just take it just like, you know, all of us have a photo ID or a fingerprint. They say, how could it be possible that just like one inch by half inch, there are five billion people, each one of them have a, a different fingerprint. So it's exactly gene fingerprints for those antigen recognized in a very small place on T cell. That's how it works. <clears throat> okay. Now, <clears throat> this is the TCR complex together. Again, you can see is a T cell surface. We already discussed about a TCR, which is as good as BCR, alpha beta chains, antigen binding over here. And then I said the antigen can only bind to this portion, distal portion of a TCR and not anything else. And also told you that it doesn't exist alone. It has two more uh, partners. That's why we say complex. One of them is CD3. Right? And CD3, and you can look at them and see that they all look like a immunoglobulin superfamily. So they have many common things. They both have peptide chains, then they have uh, disulfide bonds, and then this is what I was trying to tell you, that within the chain, you can see it has a gamma, epsilon, uh, delta, epsilon, so there are different kind of terminal variable regions in this particular molecule. And once they penetrate into the cytoplasm, they have these items. So these are the items, these kind of square things over here. You can see from here, these white boxes are immunoreceptor tyrosine-based activation motifs. So these are those molecules that need to be activated to let the signal go. Now, remember the idea is that any antigen or every antigen cannot initiate signaling pathway because T cell is going to create problems. It's going to be helpful though, but if you stimulate it, it's, it's going to divide and then you may have cancer of T cells because it's going to swell and it's going to be produced in large quantities and you'll be able, unable to control. So we need to make sure that the signaling pathway, so this will initiate a message to these items and then the signal transduction will continue. So this is the role <coughs> of a TCR complex. So if I was to initiate a TCR signaling, I will make sure that I would <coughs> activate these markers over here. But if I want to downregulate, I want to yeah. block that. So they are all blocking molecules that will come and that's where we go. So this is the signal transduction because that's the most important thing. By the end of the day, as I said, uh, most, of, most of the drugs, I would say 60 to 70% of the drugs are acting on G protein signaling pathways. And G protein is also one of the receptors which is there in the cytoplasm. So all the drugs, regardless of whatever their names are, they're going to go and follow that. Okay? <clears throat> so.
so what I told you that these co-receptor molecules which are there like on B cells, on T cells, they are presented on mature T cell. Now the other important thing to remember is to use this term naive or mature or non-activated and activated. It's just like a neutrophil which is running in the blood. It has a capability of showing those integrin that will log on to selectin expressed on endothelium before they are moving into the tissues. If you don't express integrins and you don't express selectin, they'll keep on running in the blood because they are not needed outside. So normally, T cells would not express all the signals. They would only express the signals when needed. So once they get activated, they start expressing those signals. Okay. The most important co-receptor for T cell is CD4 or CD8. You can see from here, they again look like a immunoglobulin. They look like antibodies because they are the same family. Right? So for every one CD8, we have two CD4. So we have twice the number of CD4 as compared to CD8. Because CD4 are helper cell and CD8 are the killer cells. But in AIDS, it's reversed. So you have more killer cell than CD4 tell because HIV virus kills the T cells. So you can see from here, either it's decreased or sometimes it's actually zero. And <clears throat> I'm gonna go in detail how and where they are expressed, but it's just a recap from whatever we covered in MSC. Remember I said the MSC class two is e expressed on antigen presenting cell, macrophages, B cell, thymic epithelial cell, whereas MSC class one is expressed on all nucleated cells. Somebody asked me this question. Doesn't mean that these don't have an MSC1. They can because they are nucleated. But as a rule, if you want to remember that all nucleated cells can create MSC and stick it on, on the surface. And these CD4 and CD8 are also called adhesion molecules for a good reason. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Let's see over here. So you have two antigen presenting cells, one and two. One presents antigen in context with MSC class two. The other presents MSC class one. Right? Does anybody remember the name of this little piece I said very important for MSC class one? Huh? I said, remember the major difference between MSC class one and MSC class two is this molecule. Beta 2 microglobulin. So it's a small little molecule, beta 2 microglobulin. And you can go back and look at MSC, you will see the differences. If you look at the table that we have class 1, class 2, this was a major thing. But anyway, so both of them have a capability to present a peptide. And since this is an MSC class 2, it's going to bind with TCR and CD4 receptor. So remember the CD4 receptor is a co-receptor and it adheres to MSC class 2. That's why it's also called adhesion receptor. On the other hand, when you have MSC class 1 presented to a CD8 cell, so CD8 cell again adheres to MSC. So CD4 and CD8 are co-receptors that would determine the subtype of T cells that would also determine adhesion. Okay, so if there is no CD4 or CD8, that kind of connection will be weak, right? And then there would not be signal translation, or there will be signal translation, but not to that intensity. Okay, so in order for you to enhance signal translation, we have to have co-receptor. That's what it shows over here. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when I talked of T cells, I think right now maybe you have this impression that either they have CD4 uh, 
T cell receptor or CD8 T cell receptor, but that's the basis of a T cell, but not always. There's another cell which is there in uh, epithelium, especially intestinal epithelium, and uh, that doesn't express CD4 or CD8. And that expresses gamma delta, we call them gamma delta cells. The CD4, CD8 are called alpha beta cells based upon the chain, alpha beta chain that they have. Just like we have uh, <coughs> IgG and IgD in B cell, depending upon that chain, we have alpha beta expressed in CD4, CD8. And if none of them is expressed, we call them gamma delta. And there are tons of them, and they are called intraepithelial, intraepithelial cell, IEL. And they are very important in mucosa. What will be the significance if I tell you they are important in mucosa? Okay, the, the significance of that is that, yeah. Okay, the significance of, uh, is this because uh, asthma, asthma is a mucosal problem. Oh, and uh, gastrointestinal diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, allergies, everything is happening in mucosa. So these cells have a role there. The question is that they were there. Just can imagine that uh, when we were medical students, we were told that there were some cells and we had no clue about what are these cells. But now we know that these cells are intraepithelial cells and they don't have an alpha beta chain, they have a gamma delta chain. Right? So the point is that uh, T cells have different subtypes depending upon the co-receptor. Okay. We also talked about co-stimulatory ligands. Remember, like a B cell, if you look at the, the receptor expression, again, I'm going to give you the high five thing. So you pretty much know that on top of receptor, co-receptor, there are co-stimulatory ligands. So there are ligands over here, which will stimulate, like accelerate, right? And then again, there are other molecules that we have that will be adhesion or homing, same as B cell. Okay, so let's see. And these are the ones that I said that uh, you need to know the names. And let's see them over here. Again, you see a T cell surface. It has a T cell receptor. Alpha beta, it has a, a CD3 receptor and the zeta chain, all these together. I give an example like a switch on, you have to have at least three prongs over here, right, to get this switch on. Nothing will get on if you miss one of these. Though this one over here is important, but these two are important in terms of getting signaling on. Then there's a co-receptor, either CD4 or CD8. These are the co-stimulatory molecules. They are adhesion molecules and they are homing molecules, exactly the same that we have in B cell and AP cell. But your challenge will be to figure out which one is present on T or B cell. Okay, that needs a little bit of a, a understanding. So, <laughs> these are the molecules that interact with the B cell. So T cell talks to a B cell, okay? And these are the molecules. If I was to ask you, MSC, is it on T cell or B cell? Huh? No. It is never on the T cell. Exactly. Does that make sense? So, you see the point? So T cell, T cell, right? So antigen presenting cell, you're going to have to go back and look at the list of the antigen presenting cell. B cell is there, but not T cell. So that's the basic understanding, okay? <clears throat> then again, CD40 is present on the B cell. B7 was on the B cell. ICOS was on the B cell and cytokine receptors. These are all B cells on B cell they interact with the receptors on the T cell. 
okay? So that's the important thing that you need to remember. Sorry? Ligand, ligand, corresponding ligand. Okay. I'm just telling you ligand, but I'm going to give you the name. CD, CD3 molecule, ligand. And then CD2A is one of the molecules. Correct, there. correct. Okay. okay. Now, <clears throat> there were two molecules expressed. So B7 was expressed on the B cell, mm -hmm. but T cell has two important molecules. One is CD28 and the other is CTLA4, right? And I told you CD28 is an accelerator and CTLA4 is a brake. So that is for stimulation, this is for inhibition. So these are the two important molecules that right now there are quite a few drugs uh, that have been developed. And as a matter of fact, I think we did invite uh, Dr. Marisa Allegri, she's a professor of immunology at University of Chicago. They were the one who discovered that, CTLA4. So we invited her, I think, two years ago to give a lecture on CTLA-4. But CTLA-4 is an important molecule in terms of cancer, in terms of transplant, and we sometimes need to... You remember, we can either put it there or remove it there, so we have that kind of liberty. So anyway, integrin selectin pretty much the same. Uh, ICAM, CD2, LFA. These are some of the molecules. They are important uh, for homing or adhesion. These are the molecules present on to T cells, which will make sure the T cell go to where they need to go. And they are already there in the picture. I'm just put it up over there for you to come up with a mnemonic or try to remember them. <clears throat> okay. Now, let's go one step back in terms of the TCR chain. Again, uh, no need to get confused. You will see over here, like B cell, they have a variable choices in the variable, which are about 42 sequences. And then for D, they have like three and three sequences. And for variables, you can see the T cell receptor also have same choices on a gene like BCR. So if you look at the 500, 300 of a B, B cell gene or BCR gene is pretty much the same. Rather, it has more as compared to B cell. Okay? And you can see the same routine follows in terms of making choices that we have a different VDJ segment for each and every T cell as we have different VDJ segment for each and every B cell. So B cells are unique and T cells are unique based upon the gene, okay? And these are complementary regions on the gene, <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> the question you may be asked is that <clears throat> what causes generation uh, of TCR diversity? The answer is same as BCR. We, di we discussed that in detail when we talked about BCR. B BCR, same enzymes are involved same recombinases, and when I told you B cell, I said, I want you to know at least two, which are recombination activation genes, RAG1 and RAG2. That's like summarizes the basic concept. If you were to ask why there's a diversity uh, at TCR. Okay, now, this is a uh, section of uh, thymus. I remember we, when we discussed thymus, we said, is present uh, at birth. So this is a organ in the fetus that produces T cells, that's what we call thymus T cells. And again, you can see it has a capsule, cortex, and you will see all different cells over here. So these are the cells <coughs> being produced. So thymus, when we when these cells are produced and T cells are important, and remember when I said that self versus non-self, so all those T cells which are produced, they carry the ability to recognize other antigen, right? If they were to pick up a antigen 
which is self antigen we want to remove them if you don't remove them over there then they will cause problems so what thymus does is it deletes those file right so we call it negative selection okay because what it looks at it looks at the uh, when the t cells are made and they have these vdr segment so these t cells are circulated to the entire body to familiarize with the antigens of all body but remember one thing as i said that this we're talking about intrauterine life and babies are sterile they are not infected so there is no virus bacteria or any other fungus or so on so forth to mess up their genes or mess up their uh, you know kind of uh, <clears throat> variable segment so it looks at it and happy so all these are pulled away from the circulation they are tagged and garbaged by a process of apoptosis. apoptosis okay so that's very neat but again remember let's say i think it's in the next slide let me go to the next slide <coughs> so t cell differentiation that's what happening in thymus uh, so they are made over there and each one of them is given a unique ID, which is a TCR. So they acquire that TCR <clears throat> in thymus. Children born, most of the genetic diseases are in new, newborns. Keep that in mind. The reason is because that's where you have innate humanity. That's where you have this, uh, what do you call it? It's just like a computer with hardware. Right? If hardware is there, you can put up software or apps later on. If there's a problem with the hardware, the apps would not work. So you have to have operating system which is there valid. And it is, it is made at birth. So most of the time, you will see over here, the ch children born with failed thymus we call D. George syndrome. We'll discuss one full lecture on immunodeficiencies. We call these Diseases, immunodeficiencies. A person has immunodeficiency, and this one lecture in clinical immunology. We want to create <coughs> that scene in experiments. We want to do experiment to find out how to help them. So what we do is that we take this mice and knock out thymus, remove the thymus. This is thymus is the same in animals as well. So when we do that, we call those <coughs> mice nude mice because they lack hair. I mean, this is just the name. Okay. The idea is that <clears throat> if the T cells are not developed, you have defective T cell, so you would not be able to fight infections. So we'll have a problem that T cell responses will be defective if that kind of differentiation and that kind of maturation is not taking place in time. So time remains an important organ. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you look at the stages of development again uh, keep you can put like B cell development T cell development and uh, you'll see familiarity again there's a common lymphoid precursor and <clears throat> the very first thing that you will have over here we call it double negative cell so DN stand for double negative cell right now in terms of chain we have a gamma delta I told you gamma delta can go and locate in epithelium or we can have beta and in the beta one we have three double positive so three and we have double positive double positive means that the very first chain that they make is both cd4 cd8 that's why we say double positive positive. and then what thymus will do is that it will make this selection as a positive selection, you have a single positive cell. So you want to make sure it doesn't like double positive. It's going to remove one of them and have two sets of uh, population. So all of these things are happening in thymus. So if you have no thymus, this will not happen. Or if you have a cancer of thymus, for example, thymoma, or you have a problem with thymus. So all these things would not happen. Okay? That makes sense? 
So you can see the steps over here. You start with a common lymph, if I was to say common myeloid precursor. What cell I'm, I'm talking about? Sorry? Loader. Loader. You want to say something? Say loader. Don't, yeah, why? Which cells? Huh? If I was to say instead of common lymphoid, I say common myeloid cells. Very good. Neutrophils. Because lymphoid cells are both B and T cells. If you look at the original description of the cells, myeloid cells are neutrophils, common neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, as compared to lymphoid, which basically are going to go to lymphocytes. They are granulocytes. Okay, that's why we have two kinds of cancer. Acute myeloid leukemia. And then we, it's called AML. Then we have a cancer called acute lymphoid leukemia, ALL. Then we have two other cancers which are chronic myeloid leukemia. Then we have a chronic lymphocyte leukemia. So there are four important blood cancers, very common. So good. Okay, so you can see this thymic selection is taking place in thymus, so importance of thymus. <coughs> so <coughs> we, and what well, said, pre T cell, you saw that double positive cell, thymic selection. There is one important, uh, a gene that basically is important in negative selection. We call autoimmune regulatory gene product, which is called AIRE. Just remember the name of it, and I will discuss that in detail when I teach you autoimmune diseases. Because this is normal, right? And then <coughs> things can disappear, okay? Now, <clears throat> so far, we talked about CD4 T cell, CD8 T cell. I talked about gamma delta cells or inter TL cells. But there are some other type of cells that are also developed in thymus. They are natural killer cells, NK cell, right? Non-killer cells. NK T cells, then T regulatory cells. So these are also, these two are T cells. These are not T cells. So NK T cells and NK cells. So these are again two sets of T cells that are also differentiated <coughs> in thymus. And especially for T regulatory cells. So uh, there are a couple of more slides which are going to come, the role of T regulatory cells. Okay. And as, as always say, the picture figure speaks for, for thousands of words. <clears throat> now, what is happening is that you have, again, a double positive cell, which has a CD4 and CD8. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you remember, I said thymus has epithelial cell. So thymus has epithelial cell. It has an information of all your genes. So it's like a storehouse. It's like a big robot the Google people have. You can type over things. The, the robot will pick it up and kind of give you a message in terms of search. So that kind of ability is in thymus. So you can see from here, uh, thymus epithelial cell have ability to present MSC class 1 or class 2. So it will present it to the newly made double positive cell, right? And inter after interaction, it will make a choice we call positive selection. So it's going to go for a positive selection and will separate out CD4 versus CD8. So that kind of an ability is there to make sure that the thymic epithelial cell is presenting self-peptides. These are self-peptides. So all your cells have a ID number that's stored in thymus, and this is presented to CD4 and CD8 cell for them to make sure that they are unable to recognize it, right? But if they do, for example, <clears throat> then we have a problem, right? The other thing that happens is, for example, <clears throat> if there's a CD8 cell over here, right? Uh, it doesn't really react with 
thymic epithelial cell and this lack of reaction will kill the thymic cell. We'll discuss that in a while that sometime if a cell is not recognized the system will delete it. Okay, but the point for this figure is that thymus epithelial cell have a capability to pick up cells which are double positive based upon a marker which they can identify. We call it positive selection. So that's the whole idea. And then you can see from here <coughs> single positives, CD4 and CD8. <coughs> now, this is how the negative selection, so now that was a positive selection, this is how the negative selection looks like. So you have a CD4 positive cell, you have a CD8 positive cell, then you have a dendritic cell. Right? In the previous figure I showed you thymic epithelial cells and dendritic cells. Both can present antigen. Now the thymic dendritic cell also has ability to present the self antigen, right? And you can see that in this case, what may happen is that it's going to look at affinity. Those of you who are coming for the lab today, I think there was a, a, a prerequisite. I want you to understand avidity, affinity. These are the terms. How is your bonding? So if your bonding is very strong, we call strong affinity. As compared to less bonding, we call less affinity. So you can see from here, this is affinity reaction. Sometimes the binding is very low or intermediate and sometimes the binding is very high. So what it does is that if it finds out, hey, it's going to look at your own uh, antigen, but the binding is weak. So let it go because that's not a big issue because binding has to be strong for reaction. If the binding is like, for example, a high affinity reaction, then there's a problem there. So we want to make sure that we remove that. That's called a negative selection. But if it's the lower intermediate, we will let it go and it leaves the thymus as CD4 and CD8. So you can see from here, the whole idea is that we want to make sure that all your T cells before they leave thymus, they are processed by the thymic epithelial cell for negative selection. They are processed by dendritic cell for positive selection before they go. If you understand this concept, you'll be able to understand autoimmune diseases, okay? And finally, <clears throat> I think uh, what I did was, and uh, you can make your own, that uh, difference between, because we, we already finished B cell and T cell, so we want you to make a list of properties of the B cell, list of properties of the T cell, so you can see each of them, for example, it says membrane receptor, connections, tissue distribution, Lifespan, so you see lifespan is short, right? As compared to lifespan is long, right? Surface antibodies, because there's a surface antibody present in the B cell, which is either M or D. There's no antibodies over there. They secrete antibody, they secrete lymphokines. So they secrete soluble proteins we call lymphokine as compared to the B cell that secrete antibodies. Now you can see that uh, function, they are both for humoral or antibody mediated, and this is for cell mediated immune system. So we have humoral and we have cell mediated. If you look at blood, you see 20% of lymphocytes are B cells, whereas 80% of our lymphocytes are. So remember, if you have a viral infection, so the blood report, are they going to look at neutrophils or lymphocytes? Lymphocyte. lymphocyte. But if you have bacterial infection, what are they going to look at? Neutrophils. Okay. So in lymphocytos, we call lymphocytosis, increase number of lymphocytes. So you can see 80% are CD4. Function over here, movement to infection site, we talk about that. Again, quite a few other functions are given in terms of the importance of B and T cell. Most of the time, uh, uh, I think I remember a professor used to say, if by choice, you were given a choice, you want to lose B cell or T cell, which one you want to lose? Huh? 
B cell. Okay, the reason is because you can still compensate with only small, but you cannot fight pathogens and all these things if you lose the T cell. So what is the problem with HIV? What do they do? They lose T cells. So HIV use a T cell, they cannot put up a fight, they eventually die of infection. Okay? So I'll stop here.